Brother Ricky was uh, teaching concerning Peter walking on water and about the storms of life. And, you know, we can look back over this last year, and he's brought us through it. Can you say amen? And there's been a lot of difficulties. A lot of things have happened here at the church. Uh, there are still people that haven't totally recovered from this COVID. Uh, they're still concerned about their health. They're older in age, and some of them are concerned about their companions. But no matter what the reason is, he brought us through this past year, and he's going to bring us through this year too. But sometimes uh, we as Christians, due to our heavy load in this last day, a lot of people are real responsible on their job. They put a lot of hours in. They don't have the time a preacher does or somebody full-time in the ministry to pray and read. And that's what church is all about. We all have a different function. And you have a ministry right there on the job where you're at. And when you come to church, you want the preacher to have a message. You want songs to be sang under the anointing. You want to be touched so you can go out during the week around the people that you have to work with and be a strong Christian. Right there is where your test takes place. It's not here in the church. It's outside of the church. When you're meeting people in your everyday life, we need to be strengthened while we're here in the church. And I pray the Lord has given me a message today that will strengthen us all. Uh, I'm going to be preaching about uh, the needs uh, for trials and temptations and chastisement. And, you know, each one of these are a subject within themselves. And a lot of times uh, we might be being chastised because we made some bad decisions and God's going to scold us. He's our Heavenly Father We've been born again into his family, so him and the Godhead, I like to include all three, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We know Jesus is our Savior. He's our Redeemer. We know God is our Father, and the Holy Ghost is our Comforter. So this is where our energy, spiritual energy, comes from. It's from a preached word, a sang word, a testimony, but it has to have the Bible in it in order for the Bible's will to be done. I mentioned Alex said something in our last service. Uh, we had a young girl to sing one of the old songs, and he said he certainly was glad that some of our young people were reaching back and getting some of the old songs. But how many, again, I'm going to ask you like I did in that service, how many was in our last Wednesday night prayer meeting service? I mean, song service, I'm sorry. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, these were not old songs they sang. They were contemporary songs, but most of them were saturated with the Word of God. And this is the one thing that I want to emphasize here today, whether it's preaching, whether it's testifying, whether it's singing a song. We need to have contents of the Bible in what we're doing because it's all about the Scriptures. It's all about there's power in the Word. And when you're in a storm of life, uh, you, you, need, you need sometimes help that no human being, of course, can give you. We can help each other to a degree with certain things, but there are certain things no one can help you with. It's on a spiritual level. And unless you learn how to uh, do resources and, and incorporate the Word of God into your life, it don't mean you're not a Christian. It's just meaning that most of the battles that you're going to go into, you're going to be defeated while you're there. I don't mean you're lost now just because you're defeated in a battle. It's just, it's not good. How many here knows what I'm talking about? I look back as I uh, prayed and studied and prepared this message. Uh, I, I, I know myself, I, I, I couldn't count the battles that I've been in. You couldn't count, think about the battles you've been in so far in your Christian life. Think about the many hardships that you've had, but yet, like Brother Ricky was bringing it out, uh, God's still with us. He said, I'll never leave you. He helped you out of last year like I've already been over it. He's going to help us out of this year. He's going to help us until we reach our destination. Now, I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter, the first chapter, and I'll read verses 3 through 8. Uh, 1 Peter, first chapter, 
verse 3 through 8. I do want to emphasize again the importance of understanding that trials are different than temptations. You can overlap them in some cases. They mean the same thing, but in other cases they mean something else, and chastisement is something totally different too. But here we go, 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, I just want to stop here and insert this in. If Jesus had not have been resurrected from the dead, our purpose being here today is void. We don't need to be here. We're here because Jesus was resurrected from the dead. If you sing gospel songs and Jesus had not been resurrected from the dead, you might be able to sing them, but if he wasn't resurrected from the dead, that singing is not going to fulfill the purpose it's supposed to be because there'll be no blessing in that song. Maybe entertainment Jesus is not here to entertain us. He's here to bless us. He's here to strengthen us. He's here to help us when we're down and we don't know which way to go and the storm is on. He wants us to know if he got us out of the boat, Brother Ricky, we're going to get back in the boat. He wants us to know when he told them we're going to the other side. If you're in the boat with Jesus, I don't care how bad the storms get, you're going to the other side. That's unquestionable. That's unquestionable. You're going to make it to the other side. Now, beginning in verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible, don't you like that, an undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now listen at the fifth verse. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I don't keep myself. You don't keep yourself. I'm kept by the power of God. You're kept by the power of God. You're not born of corruptible seed. You and I are born of incorruptible seed by the word of God that lives and abides forever. When we begin to think about being kept by the power of God, then we begin to notice, we begin to notice that we are to understand that through faith we are doing this. Then he goes and encourages us in verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice, how many comes to service sometime and you just greatly rejoice? You come to service time because Jesus has been resurrected. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish, but unto you and I that are saved, it is a power of God unto salvation. We're in greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, notice it said, if need be. Maybe there's a reason that we wouldn't really uh, need to have to go through this season, uh, that ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than that of gold that perished, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of of Jesus Christ. Now, I mentioned something, Brother Ricky, when you was talking and left room to speak. We were talking about the trials, the temptations, and, and the things that we have to go through. And now I'm preaching about the needs, the trials, temptations, and chastisement. You know, all of these are for a purpose, but I wonder if there might be a shortcut to this. I wonder if God couldn't give us a shortcut to this. Maybe we're not uh, shouldn't be going through so many trials. Maybe we shouldn't be going through so many temptations. If we would go back to Matthew, the sixth chapter, uh, verse 33, if we would learn that it didn't, shouldn't take trials for us to call on God, it shouldn't cause strong temptations on us, 
The Bible said if we will make it a habit in our everyday life and seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, all of these other things shall be added unto us. How many agree with me in your prayer life? Do you think you ought to pray more? Come on, now help me in this part. It's very important you help me in this part. How many think you ought to pray more? How many believe you ought to read your Bible more? How many believe you ought to come to church more? How many believes that you need to believe more because you can pray all you want to. You can come to church all you want to, but you got to believe what you're hearing. You got to accept what you're hearing. And he said, the mind that is stayed upon the Lord shall find perfect peace. Don't sound like there's a whole lot of trials. Don't sound like there's a whole lot of temptations there. When God called the children of Israel out of the Egyptian bondage, I shared it with somebody on the way in. You know, like I do, when they got out of Egypt, there was 10 plagues that was put upon the Egyptian people and they were delivered from the Egyptian bondage. How many can raise your hand and say, Gene, I've been delivered from sin. I've been delivered from that bondage that I was under. I was, in, I was bound, but now I've been delivered. Now they're leaving Egypt. They, they take the spoils. How many after God saved you, did he give you a life like you never dreamed you'd have? How many did he touch your life? How many here did God give you a good wife, a good husband? How many here has God give you a good job, a good place to live, a good church to come to, good singers, good musicians, good Sunday school teachers? Are we blessed? Do we have a right to rejoice and say, thank you, dear God, for what you're doing for us, Lord? He said, I'll do it for anybody. I don't have any respect for the church of God in Sampson City. I don't have respect for the church of God. I don't have respect for the Baptists. I don't have respect for the Methodists. I have respect for what they're preaching. I have respect for their praying, for their seeking my face. It'll happen to anybody. You can be the most feeble one in this church today, but if you'll start making a habit to pray every day, if you'll make it a habit to read your Bible every day, if you'll make it a habit to testify to somebody, I wonder, I just wonder if we would have to go through as many trials through as many hardships. I'm just wondering myself. Are you hearing me? I'm wondering. I'm not just saying that. I'm wondering. I haven't been where I'm at right now too long. And I'm being, I'm, I'm, I'm walking and I'm living in the Spirit because I'm doing what I'm telling you to do. I haven't done this all my Christian life. I'm doing it now. Am I going to keep on doing it? That's up to me. And the moment I quit doing it, I won't have the authority I'm preaching with right now. Come on, I'm preaching with authority. Somebody said, you're bragging, oh, it's the Holy Ghost. I'm preaching with authority. You say, I'm preaching with authority, not because I'm gifted, not because you're gifted that you're singing. It's all about obeying what God said, and you can obey God as a very young person, middle age, or wait till you get old. It don't matter. God never changes. He's not like a shadow that changes. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and God said if you'll supply the man, if you'll supply the woman, you don't have to be outstandingly gifted. You don't have to have a voice like a mockingbird. You don't have to have a way of delivering things. He said, I use people through their dedication. I'm not concerned about your talents. I gave you your talents. Why should I rejoice over something I gave to you? What he says I'm glad of is that you're obeying me and you believe I am who I am. That's the most powerful thing you can say is believing that Jesus is who he says he is. The Bible said, what is the work of God? Believing that Jesus is who he says he is. That's what's going to keep you out of heaven is not believing that Jesus is the son. Somebody said, oh, it's going to be my slack in my work. You're not going to heaven for your works. It's your faith you're going to heaven with. 
You're going to have works because you are saved. And faith without works is dead being alone. So you got to get the equation right. If you want to keep your faith up, you got to have righteous works, not self-righteous works. If you get to where you can sing extra good, you get to where you can teach a Sunday school class extra good, or whatever your works are, I don't care how good you get, how refined you get, that's not your key to heaven. Your key to heaven is when you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. That is the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father except by me. Oh, our trials and temptations are for a reason. And I'm going to get into that. I am going to get into that. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now listen, whom having not seen yet loved in whom thou, though now ye see him not, ye not, Yet believing, he rejoiced with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, I'm standing here behind this pulpit this morning preaching to you. I got saved in 1963. God saved my soul. I, oh, all kind of time has passed. Now, Tag, when did you get saved? Think about it. Pinpoint the time when you got saved. I've come through, as I've already said, I've come through so many trials. And every one of them, I'm beginning to see more clear was necessary. The little ones, the big ones, the testing of being tempted, and then the chastisement. You know what all that tells me? I'm in the security of God. He's keeping me by his power. He's keeping me by his word. He lets us know through the word, you're my child. You're not illegitimate. You belong to the Lord. You got somebody watching out for you. And you notice kids don't understand sometimes. They think you're a prophetess or a prophet. Uh, you, you can, you've been there. You've done that. Kids, really, you younger people, that stuff you think you got by with that you don't think we suspicioned you about, hang it up. And any parent here said, my kids are so good. They never do anything wrong. Wake up. Wake up. We're all battling a warfare. We're all battling a warfare. And there's only one. There's only one that can help us to be conquerors. And he's in us. Greater is he that's in us and he that is in this world. Somebody said, don't you need to know more? Not, not if you really know that. Not if you really know that. When the devil comes to you, if you're fervent in your prayer life, if you're fervent in reading your Bible, if you're fervent in testifying, and the devil comes against you, you don't have to quote any more Bible to him than this. It said that greater is he that's within you than he that is in the world. When the devil comes and says, gee, I've got you under enough pressure, you've got to succumb. You say, uncle, I know it in my flesh. That's true. But I want to introduce you to a man that knocked on my door one day. I opened up my heart's door and he come in to sup with me. He come in to stay with me. And I want to tell you, you can overcome me every day, but you can't overcome the one that is in me ever, ever, ever. You cannot overcome the one that's in me. Never can he overcome the ones that sent us. Ooh, ooh. We haven't seen him, though, but yet we believe. Now, you know the story. It probably comes to your mind, Thomas. Other apostles had seen the Lord. They were in the right place at the right time. Thomas ran a little slack. He got a testimony from his friends. He'd been with three years at least. They'd seen Jesus raise the dead. They, they saw Peter walking on water. They saw lame people getting up from the ground. And you would have thought all those ten men at that time, Judas had betrayed the Lord, all those ten men saying to Thomas, Thomas, we seen the Lord. You'd think he'd open his arms up and say, my goodness, that is great news. He said, I will not believe. 
In other words, I'm not going to play religion. I'm not going to play church. I'm going to make sure I got it where it's supposed to be. I want to be able to say clearly in my mind that I've seen the Lord. He said, except I see in his hands the print of his nails, except I take my finger and put it into the print of the nails, except I take my hand and put it into his side, he said, I will not believe. Jesus hears you. He knows when you're wrestling with doubt. He knows when you have a health problem and you've been praying about it and the symptoms are still there. He knows you're like a roller coaster. God's got you up for a little while and then the devil's got you down. He knows all about that. He heard what Thomas said. He wasn't there, but he didn't have to be there because he had already been to heaven, offered up his blood in the temple that was in heaven. He came back to spend 40 days on the earth with those that he knew. And here Thomas is in the room eight days later and the doors being shut. Jesus appeared in the room with them and he said, Thomas, behold my hands. Take your finger, Thomas, and put it into my hands. Take your hand, Thomas, and put it into my side. Be not faithless, but believe. He said, oh, Oh, I believe there was some, how many believe there was some emotions there right then? There's emotions when God begins to deal with you and begins to speak to you in your heart. He said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you believe, but blessed are those that have not seen and yet have believed. We're all here today. We haven't seen our Lord and Savior, but how many? How many can raise your hand and say, Gene, I, I don't know how you know it, Phyllis. I don't know how you know the Lord. I, I don't really know how you know the Lord. I just know how I know the Lord. But have you ever noticed when you meet somebody that you know knows the Lord and your spirit has borne witness with their spirit, how you just know they know him? They, they know him like you know him. Maybe your past a little different. Maybe different things without a doubt has happened to you and your relationship. But those things he's done for you are special to you. See, I don't know what they are, but you can't have them stole from you. They belong to you. That's your experience. That's not my, I got my own experience, but you got your experiences. Jason, that time you come to the altar and the Lord touched you the way he touched you, I love when you testified about it. That's your experience. I don't really know what you felt, but you explained it real well. I, I can't fully identify with it, but I believe it, and I know it's true. There's no doubt in my mind it's true. And I know Jason knows the Lord. I, I could go over this church and tell you conversations I've had with different ones standing talking to you, and I felt the Lord as I talked to you. Listen, we're a branch connected to a vine. We're a body, the anatomy of the body. We're eyes, we're ears, we're feet. We're not in the same location, but the trials, the temptations, the chastisement is a way that God gets us placed in his body the way he wants us to be. Don't ever rebuttal a trial. Don't ever rebuttal a temptation. Don't ever rebuttal chastisement. If you've done wrong, you ought to enjoy the Lord just giving you two or three miserable days. You ought to rejoice. That's what he's trying to say, rejoice in it. That's your father saying, I'm not letting you get by with it. And when you know you're getting a whipping with love, it takes depression out of it. It takes the feet out of it. It makes you feel like a child of God. We have to get these doctrines straight in our mind. When you're having chastisement, that's no time to give up. That's no time to say, my goodness, I'm a bad person. That's a time to anchor your eyes on the Word of God and say, you know, the Lord told me he chastised me if I got out of pocket. He told me that I was his son or I was his daughter. And that's the way we can rejoice right in the middle of trials. We can rejoice right in the middle of temptation. We can rejoice right in the middle of a good chastisement. God wants us to understand that the angels are encamped around about us. We have protection around us, church. The devil don't want us to see what I'm preaching about this morning. 
He don't want us to see, and I'm not talking about false security. I'm not talking about getting out and left field. I'm talking about Bible security. That is your eternal security, is Bible security. And what I'm preaching to you today is Bible. It's Bible. And we're kept by the power of God. Now, we just want to read now from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, being justified by faith, not by feeling, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace wherein we stand. You're standing in faith and grace today. You and I are standing in faith and grace today. And rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but glory in tribulation. Also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Now you know what Jesus said. In this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. He said, I've overcome this world. Right now, if you're in hardship, if you're going through a hard time, don't be defeated about that. If you know you've been born again, if you know you've been saved, look at the Word of God and say, God's trying to do something for me. He's allowed this tribulation. I mentioned it to Brother Ricky. I said, it's a shame. I didn't use these words, but I'm going to use them now. I'm talking to myself as well as you. It's a shame that God has to send tribulation our way to get us to do what He wants us to do. It, it is. Uh, that's why the children of Israel had such a hard time after they got out of the Egyptian bondage. They had seen the ten miracles. They had experienced the spoils, the great riches that God gave them on the way out. But no longer did they get to the Red Sea. And, and, and uh, Pharaoh decided they had made a bad mistake. He got his army together. He pursued them. And now they're at the Red Sea. They can't back up. They can't run. They've got nowhere to go. What do they start doing? They start grumbling. They start saying, oh, you brought us out here, Moses. You should have left us back there. We're going to die. What would it have been if they'd have said, Moses, we know we look like we're in trouble. We look like, and, and we're kind of a little bit concerned, but what's God fixing to do? Instead of accusing God, you brought me out here to kill me. Why would God deliver them out of that bondage? They were short-sighted. They didn't know the will of God. That's why God wants us to get in the Word so we can know the will of God. What would it read like if we read our Bible and said the children of Israel, when the Egyptian army started coming in on them, they started singing the songs of Zion. They started praying. They started worshiping their God. And then Moses stretched that rod across and the Red Sea opened up. You talking about a hallelujah march? No, they had to go there with their heads hung. God still delivered them. He still let them go through the Red Sea. And on the other side, they got victory because when they got to the other side, uh, Pharaoh and his armies thought they could do the same thing that God's people did. The devil's people can't do what God's people do. They cannot do what God's people do. They're not blessed like God's people are blessed. And they look back, and here comes that army, and they got them all in there. And Moses lowered that rod, and it came together. Miriam, she got her tambourine. They had victory on the other side. Thank God they had time to get victory because when they got to the other side, they'd have been at least three or four days feeling bad about grumbling and complaining and belly aching. And I say that because I've done my share of it in my Christian life. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And don't you look at me self-righteous. You've done a little bit of it yourself. Are you hearing what I'm trying to say? God wants us to see that he's working it out for us all, all the preacher, all of us. We need his help. We need to see this. I can't stand here. I'm preaching in authority. I feel the Holy Ghost all over me. I do. I feel the Holy Ghost all over me. I, I'm not going to reiterate something I did, told the church. I don't think I've ever told them about the bitterness that I had in my heart for a pretty good period of time, and I still preached under the anointing, and God took me back in the Old Testament when it comes to Samson, how he was a Nazarite, and 
uh, Nazarites wasn't supposed to touch a dead body and they wasn't supposed to do this and that. And Samson broke all of them, but yet the power of God would come upon him. You see, the power of God, don't, 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 don't measure your experience with what you feel. You better measure experience with what you're doing in the Bible. Just because God lets you feel it when you got bitterness in your heart don't mean he's approving it's okay. He's just taking care of you. But it comes to the final step. He let, he let this woman that had his head in her lap cut his hair. That was the final step with God. Now, there were several times that he gave her the reasons he had the strength, but he lied to her each time. But this last time, he finally showed her all of his heart. She called for the Philistines to come. She knew he had spilt his guts to her. She knew that she was fixing to get the final blow on him. She had his head cut, hair cut, and when he got up, he thought he was going to get up like the other times, but he shook himself, and the Lord had departed from him. He knew it not until the Lord had departed from him. So in our tribulations and in our, our times that we need our patience increased, and, and, and not only do we glory in tribulation, uh, uh, Paul said, uh, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, I want to stop right there and inject something in. When I was praying and studying, uh, you know and I know, you know this scripture. You know this scripture. Your strength, his strength, his strength is made perfect. Where? In, in our weakness. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Uh, the things that I'm strong in, I don't need God in, I think. Sometimes, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm trying to say? But in your weaknesses, it's where God said, I can show up. Oh, in your weakness. He said, if you'll just learn. If you are an envious person, if you are a jealous type person, if you do have strife, you have selfish ambition, that's your weakness. The Lord said, turn it over to me. Don't try to overcome it yourself. You might say, I'm not going to be jealous. You will be. You will be. I don't care how many times you say you're not. Listen, I don't want to short circuit this message, but I don't want to miss the truth that God's brought me to. I was going to bring it a little later on, but I got to bring it now. You see, when you fail in your trials, when you fail in your trials, you think you disappoint God so much. Oh, I just didn't. You hadn't disappointed God. He knew when he put the trial on you, you were going to fail. He wanted you to see what's in you. Quit denying it. You're hiding it. So he said, I'm going to bring the surface. I'm going to bring it out where you, you do something that shows that you're jealous. And that makes you feel bad and, and you feel condemned. Don't feel condemned. God don't want you to feel condemned because he knew when he put it on you what was going to happen before it happened. He wants you to know what's in you and the way he gets it out of you, you're like gold in a fire. And, 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 and think it not strange concerning the fiery trials that are to try you is so some strange thing has happened unto you. If you have a tendency to cheat on income tax, and if there's any place I would like to cheat, it would be on income tax. They've taken too much of our money. They're robbing us, and we can't even cheat them. But this is their world. I'm going to another one, Amen. Yes, the people in this world get along better. They can connive. They can take shortcuts. But God said, my people can't take shortcuts, and we don't need to. Because what we've got waiting on us, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard. It's never entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Have you been under a test lately? Now, I got it written out. It's over here. I could read it, but I'm going to try to remember it without getting detained too much. Have you lost your temper lately? Have you showed yourself in a way you just kind of come unhinged? You ever done that before since you've been saved? You see, you could help me. I, mm, I heard all that. Those others, you think I'm trying to entrap you or something. But here's the thing. 
When you do that, you think it's terrible. God said it's good. Now listen, I believe God showed me this. It's good. It's good you lost your temper because it's in you anyway. And I want you to get it out so you can see it. And most of the time when I've lost my temper since I've been a Christian, I'm so ashamed of myself. You know that sheepish feeling you got, you say. And, and, and I, I'm not bragging on myself, but I'm not one to lose my temper in an overall situation. I, I, I'm the one that buys a lot more that's used up. I should have bought a new one. And I think I, I caused my children to sin in the cemetery. I bought, what, three mowers, cutting corners. And I'll tell you, it was a cartoon. I'd be over on the weed eater, weed eating, and all of a sudden I'd hear clang, clang, clang. Those two boys of mine learned how to drive that lawnmower, snapper. They could take their body weight, and instead of when they got to the curb, they'd throw that thing up on two wheels and come. And once in a while they'd miss it, and i got to sharpen the blade. Now listen, we can bring trials on ourselves by the decisions that we make. Are you hearing? You kind of hearing what I'm saying? We can't say everything we do. It God brought us on it. God brought us into that because He also said, "If any man likes wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men, upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him." But the point is, is with especially Pentecost. Now, I can't speak for the other denominations, but in Pentecost, that's not as bad as it used to be, but every issue was a heaven or hell issue. If you lost your temper, what I come up under, you were on your way to hell. Just about. You felt like, man, man, I have done something that is terrible. But if I'd have had the proper teaching like I'm giving it now, and the preacher said, that's good, Gene, that's good, because God wants that uncovered, it's in you, then we enter into sanctification. Huh? Sanctification. Somebody said, I just can't help but get mad. Yes, you can, and God will let it come out enough. You'll be so embarrassed so many times. After a while, you say, you know what? I'm going to hold on to it just a little bit because there's a lot of misery behind this. You know what I'm talking about. And before you know it, the things that bothered you, the things that defeated you, they won't be there anymore. Let God just keep bringing them out. Just don't give up on God. Don't ever give up on God. God will never give up on you. Don't give up on God. I don't care how many times a trial, a temptation, chastisement comes your way. Get up from where you're at. Stand up on your feet and say, Devil, by the help and grace of my Father in heaven and my Son Jesus Christ and my Comforter here upon this earth, nothing shall separate me from the love of God, neither height or depth, principalities, powers. I tell you, spiritual wickedness in high places, how many believe that God is greater that's in us than he that is in this world. So we ought to thank God when we have a trial and we fail it we need to thank God when we're tempted and we fail it but the thing about it is if you do that without doing something about it that's not smart you hear what I'm saying if you just go to say well if God feels that way about it I'll just lose my temper anytime no you know you know I'm not talking that way God wants it brought to your attention so you can lay it on the altar and get it sanctified. Somebody said, you mean I can be just as sure as this preacher is standing behind this pulpit, you can have it sanctified. You can have it sanctified. Now, I wouldn't dare uncover uh, personal things in my marriage with my wife. I wouldn't. But Hazel was a gift from God to me. I needed her. I needed her more than just a wife. I needed her because of her stability. And I don't mean this as an insult, her stubbornness. The right kind of stubbornness. Anybody kind of get a hint what I'm talking about? You notice how your wife just won't agree with you a lot of times? And you're the man of the house, you know. 
you have the final word. But I will tell you something. You young people, you probably already learned it. Be smart from get-go. After I learn better, through the scriptures, through God, I want to keep this real spirit. I did. I learned through the power of the Holy Ghost. I really did. But I found out, I made it humorous, but I went to her. She may not remember the initial time I went to her. I said, honey, uh, and I might not to word it just like this, but this is the contents of what I told her. I said, Hazel, I said, I'm going to tell you something. I'm the head of the house, and I'm going to give you permission to boss me. <laughs> Takes all the heat off of me. I'm not a wimp, and I'm not henpecked. I give her permission. You better hope I never take it back. Church, I'm just trying to be humorous with something that people have a struggle with. You see, sanctification, you know who knows when mom and dad's supposed to be sanctified, their children. Not your church, not your brothers and your sisters in church, where you live. People you're around all the time, on the job, not in church. Oh, we got our suits on here. Well, I, I'm cursed with a suit. Thank God that this is not a suit church. Uh, Wear it if you want to. Wear it if you don't. But you come in here, you know, we, how you doing? Great. Everything's fine. You just had a heated discussion just before you come to church. Your children saying, everything's fine. Mama, do you know what you just said about the preacher? <laughs> I had to slip that in. You know what I got to say and I use, I don't want to know a thing said after I step out of the room. You hear what I'm saying? And you better feel the same way. Because people that's talking about somebody else, if you think they're giving you a rest, you got another thing coming. I'm just kind of meddling here. I'm kind of just tipping around here just a little bit to be real. We're human beings. And, and don't look at me with a smile and say, yeah, I know people like that. Yeah, you've been that way before yourself. Somebody said, don't point your face. You've been that way yourself. You say, you don't have the authority. I do. Everybody, everybody, we're tempted at all points. Amen. Jesus was tempted in all points. If Jesus was tempted in all points, don't you ever look back and say, oh, I never did say anything bad about the preacher. I never did say anything bad about my neighbor. I never did say anything bad, bad about my best friend. Church, this is what the fallen nature is all about. We spend our whole life trying to learn not to be that fallen person. We don't like that fallen person. And the only thing that's going to grow Jesus up in us is a prayer life, reading the Bible, going to church, witnessing, because every one of us from the preacher right now, and I am preaching with authority, but this authority that I'm preaching with is not Gene Bass. It's what I'm doing. It's how I'm seeking God. And when I cut that off, that will be cut off. It don't work any different than it does with you. If you want to work, if you want to live with less trials, pray more. If you want to live with less trials, come to church. If you want to live with rest, uh, with, <laughs> anyway, you know what I'm trying to say. My point is this. It's all about learning to obey the Word of God. This is it. I can bring this message to a close on this point. All of our church going, all that we do is trying to learn not to sit in church and just hear the word and hear the word and hear the word and hear the word. God said, get up and do it. Just get up and do it. And he said, if you'll do it, there'll be a big change in your family environment there'll be a big change. And I want to tell you this. I did say something, and I'm bragging on what God's done for me and Hazel. Hazel saw me through some rough places. I had a lot of baggage when I come to the Lord, a lot of baggage. The Lord used Hazel to see me through some places that I've been totally delivered of, totally, totally delivered of. Hadn't been a short while either. It's been years that God. Now, if I delivered of everything, if anybody ever, preacher ever stands up and tells you he don't need a little more sanctification, just talk to him after the service and say, Preacher, uh, I don't agree with what you said because my understanding is none of us will be perfect until we breathe our last breath or the trump of God sound.